everyone, it's Presley at EpicGames.com here, and today I am in my Emily from Brain Scoop cosplay because Emily is going to be doing a meetup tour singing Bobby, where you get to meet her and she'll give you a tour of the Natural History Museum. Yay! Say hi. Hi. How are you? Have you guys seen Presley's video where she impersonates me? No. no. It's like, <laughs> but I was thinking yeah, right. with the glasses. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's about the cutest thing. She wanted to wear her cosplay. So, oh. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> she needs she needs a lobster uh, sweater. Oh really? Today? Nice. Ooh, we have we pinned actually three different insects that day, and then it didn't seem to fit, seem to fit in with the cicada feed. So <laughs> we uploaded them as extra tidbits. Do you guys know what mutton busting is? I was a mutton buster as a child. This is what happened. Mutton busting. Um, <laughs> I grew up on a ranch in South Dakota. So of course you had to be a mutton buster. Um, mutton busting is the thing that they do at, at rodeos where they put children very small. Children, children, like this size, it's maybe this size, children. Um, and uh, they stick you on the back of the sheep, and then the sheep go on fur, and they'll just like grab on, and then they open up the gates, and then you got the sheep will just like, they will take off, and no stop them. Yeah. Yeah, mutton busted. Kids get hurt. It involves pterosaurs, other uh, marine reptiles from the Mesozoic, uh, Mesozo uh, things like Mosasaurus, Plesiosaurus, etc. And what I thought might be kind of fun for you guys, uh, since we're all kind of here on mass and joining the Natural History Museum, is I give you a few extra insights into the exhibit hall and a little bit of, uh, of what's there, maybe some things that aren't on the written placards that you wouldn't have otherwise known, and a little bit about what I and some of the other researchers do here with the material. Uh, we have a wonderful exhibit hall that's relatively new still, uh, I guess about five, four years old-ish in terms of uh, when it opened. So that, and I had, a, I did have a little part in its design, although not a great part because I was still working in Pittsburgh at the time. Uh, I, I moved here just a couple of years ago, but I was already somewhat connected. So. In any case, that was the kind of scenario, and if you guys are interested in that, please uh, feel free to go and follow. This is arguably my favorite exhibit in, in, the, in the hall. And that's simply for personal bias reasons. I am first and foremost a pterosaur researcher. Uh, so I'll give a little quick little shameless plug. Uh, I, you may have seen uh, some, maybe some things on some of the recent television commercials or, or television shows, rather, um, and perhaps uh, in a uh, in some of the recent books, etc., magazines about things like long-range flight and pterosaurs or the propensity for ground launch. Uh, something that you might, you might have heard the term quadrupedal launch being thrown around a lot since 2008. That was me. Uh, so that's my time to say. That is the fourth dish actually extends up against the one this way. Yeah, and they're walking on, they're walking here, walking on the, bot on the bottom of their hand. But with, so they're walking like this with on these three digits with the fourth finger hyperextended up against the elbow. Oh, and they walk like this. A bird and a crocodile has the traits and the dinosaur uh, probably has it too. That's, right. so, That's kind of cool. It's a neat way to tell stuff yeah. about the dinosaurs. Something interesting about that big sickle claw. It always in all the illustrations they like bring it forward and make things with it. It can go all the way across the bottom of the foot. It's actually opposable. It doesn't just extend out of the way. It hyperflexes too. And there's another group of living animals with wing-like forelimbs with opposable, huge, nasty claws that come across the base of the foot that don't use the forelimb to grab and prey. That's raptors. And Denver Public is a great, and it's open access, so anyone can read any of the web browser, no need subscriptions, it's lost one. Um, Denver Fowler has proposed, and, they, and when he first said it, I was like, no way. But when he actually I read the paper, it's like, Actually, it's pretty convincing. I'm impressed. Was that they're used that the forelimbs, the small, look at small wings. We know they were feathered and things like Velociraptor were in fact small wings. 
not large enough to fly with, but large enough to do exactly what hawks use their wings for when they're not flying, which is staying on top of an animal that they're murdering. So, you grab on the top, you punch your ball through it, and if you're a hawk, it's your, it's your digit one, which comes from behind. If you're a drama soul, he's proposed it's digit two, the sequel claw. And you use your little wings to stay on top until it dies. And then you eat it, and then you're happy. That's amazing. <laughs> this paper incidentally got featured on XKCD. Nice. Which paper nice. says he considers to be the, the, the number one most uh, proud moment of his professional career. <laughs> okay, so we're at the La Brea Tar Pits now, in front of the Tar Pits, and thank goodness you don't have small version because it smells weird. It smells like a mix of celery and spinach, and it's just weird. Um, but we're here at the La Brea Tar Pits, so let's go check out the museum. Oh, they get this tar without dying. Oh. Okay, so we're doing this thing where you have to pull on the handle and see how hard it is to get our Oh, oh there's tar. I see how it's down here. Prehistoric version of a steak knife. I think it may have functioned the same way. So in order for this thing to get a sufficient bite using these teeth, we think that it could open its jaw about 90 degrees. So just a very heavy duty bite. Also, we think that it was about the size of an African lion. So you have the skeleton right here depicting that. And uh, we know that it had two sets of teeth. So if it broke its sabers at any point, the adult ones, that was it. So if you look at, there's an individual right here that, that displays broken sabers. And we think this may be because he attacked the prey and bit into an area where there's denser bone and may have gotten caught. So we think that it used the sabers themselves to, uh, to slash at the neck or the stomach, preferably softer spots of an animal, so that the animal would bleed to death and then it could use the rest of its teeth to chop up the meat. And as you can see, it doesn't have mo molars in the same sense we do, but in a way that would have relied heavily on, uh, on meat. I got this moving mammoth thingy, my Bob. So I think if you walk by here, it'll move around a little bit and it'll eat that noise you probably heard. And it will be. They were feast, feasting or hunting things that were a lot bigger than them and things that are a lot bigger than what wolves hunt today. So they're a lot stronger and they're a lot, what? they have a lot more muscle than normal than the other wolves around here. So they are pretty cool looking. I mean, they look, they look a lot more like a wolf than you expected if you actually came. So we had a ton of fun today. We went to La Brea, we went to the museum with Emily. We did a ton, we went to a Japanese bookstore, which is, wasn't on camera. But we had a ton of fun today. And I'd like to thank you for watching, and I will see you tomorrow.